morning. Thank you for participating in our adult day training redesign waiver support coordinator webinar. I'm Kent Carroll, a senior management analyst with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. I will be co-presenting on today's webinar. And good morning, my name is Liesl Ramos, and I'm a program administrator with APD in the Division of Operations. During the webinar, you can use the question feature to submit your questions. At the end of the webinar, we will attempt to answer as many questions as time permits. If we do not get to your question, the answer will be added to the FAQ posted on our website. And a link to the FAQ will be given to you at the end of this presentation. Also, the presentation is being recorded and a link to the recording will be posted to our website at a later date. No in-service training credits uh, will be awarded for participating in this webinar. During today's webinar, we will discuss the purpose of the ADT redesign and provide background information to help understand why these changes are taking place. We will describe the changes that will be occurring as a result of the ADT redesign. We'll introduce the new Life Skills Development Level 4 pre-vocational service. We'll describe the person-centered conversations related to employment, describe how to help clients achieve their employment related goals, discuss a scenario. We will also talk about how to obtain service authorizations and provide time for questions and answers. The purpose of the ADT redesign is to bring the iBudget waiver-funded adult day training and supported employment services into compliance with the federal home and community-based settings final rule from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. The changes must be in place by the federal deadline of March of 2023 and just as a point of clarification, you may be asking why March of 2023? This deadline was set in place by the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And the state of Florida, just like all other st states in the nation, must comply with it. States that do not comply may be placed on a corrective action plan. The changes are intended to create more pathways to employment for all APD clients who have expressed a desire to work and also to provide increased access to the community and employment services for APD clients through activities that enhance independence, build community inclusion, expand the client's personal choices, and provide opportunities for more social connections. This can include opportunities for day trips. Some additional background information for you. In 2014, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services implemented the CMS final rule that requires states to increase opportunities for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to access employment in competitive integrated settings. The CMS waiver application instructions and technical guide do not allow for habilitation services such as ADT to pay waiver clients for services that are vocational in nature, that is, for the primary purpose of producing goods and providing services. Waiver funding is not available 
for the provision of vocational services delivered in facility-based or sheltered working settings. This is where individuals are supervised for the primary purpose of producing goods or performing services. And this is according to the CMS Information Bulletin dated September of 2011. Next, we'd like to uh, let, tell you a little bit about what is changing. Well, first of all, adult day training services are being revised to include therapeutic recreation to assist individuals in developing and maintaining life skills that enable them to participate in community-engaged, meaningful day activities. ADT will no longer include volunteering or job training activities. Something that is not changing is that ADT should always occur at a location other than the residence of the client. Support should be provided in accordance with the client's person-centered support plan, be outcome-oriented, and be designed to teach life skills. Providers can engage clients in activities that enhance independence, build community memberships, expand the client's personal choices, and provide opportunities for more social interactions. Second, we've added a new service called Life Skills Development for or Pre-Vocational Services. And this service is being added as an option to provide pre-vocational training and work experiences on a time-limited basis. Pre-vocational services include volunteer work to develop general non-job task-specific skills that will help people transition to vocational rehabilitation and eventually obtain paid employment in competitive, integrated community settings some of these experiences could include volunteer work. Providers will need to ensure that they are providing pre-vocational services in accordance with the client's individualized needs and support plan goals. We will describe what non-job task specific skills are in a few moments. In addition to that, the rates for group supported employment services are being changed to match the rates of adult day training. Next slide, please. So here is a visual of what adult day training service looks like and what are the types of changes that will occur. So on the left column, we have listed some of the components of adult day training service as we know it now. And this includes training in the activities intended to support the participation of individuals in valued routines of the community, training services that include meaningful day activities and training in the activities of daily living, adaptive skills, and social skills. This training currently includes volunteering, job exploration, and paid employment services. And ADT also includes the off-site models that teach specific job skills and other skills directed at meeting specific employment objectives. So you may be asking, what is changing? What is the new adult day training service going to look like? Well, look at the column that says now. <clears throat> Life Skills Development Level 3 or Adult Day Training will continue to offer training activities intended to support the participation of individuals in valued routines of the community. That has not changed. ADT will continue to offer training that is age and culturally appropriate and will assist the individuals with the acquisition, retention, or improvement in self-help adaptive skills and socialization. ADT services 
include therapeutic recreation, which includes the acquisition of skills that build positive social behaviors, interpersonal competence, greater independence, and personal choice. Now, beginning in March of 2023, providers will be required to comply with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services settings final rule, which prohibits clients from working in facility-based settings during waiver services. Pre-vocational services will be offered to individuals who need to acquire non-job task specific training before working at or above minimum wage. Clients who work at or above minimum wage can receive supported employment services to assist them in maintaining employment. For this reason, ADT will no longer include training in the areas of volunteering related to job skills, job exploration, paid employment services, or off-site mob mobile work crews. Along with the addition of new, uh, a new pre-vocational service to the iBudget waiver, transportation services will be available through the waiver to provide rides to and from the new pre-vocational service just as it is now for clients attending adult day training. Now let's take a closer look at life skills development for pre-vocational services. This service should enable each individual to attain the highest level of work in the most integrated setting and with the job matched to the individual strengths, interests, priorities, abilities, and capabilities while following applicable federal wage guidelines. This service is intended to develop and teach general skills. Um, the services that are provided should be learning services and work experiences including volunteer work where the individual can develop general non-job task specific strengths and skills that contribute to employability employability and paid employment in integrated community settings as we said earlier these services are time limited which is 36 months the service may restart but can only total 36 months and with specific skills that contribute to employability. And these skills and training must be included to, comp to work towards the individual's goals on their person-centered planning uh, uh, support plan. And this support, support plan is to be reviewed not less than annually or more frequently as requested by the individuals. Individuals receiving pre-vocational services must have employment-related goals, as I said earlier, and these goals are to be in keeping with their person-centered service plan. The successful outcome of this service is to achieve competitive, integrated employment in the community for which an individual is compensated at or above the minimum wage, but not less than the customary wage and level of benefits paid by the employer for the same or similar work performed by individuals without disabilities. Next slide, please. Additionally, all pre-vocational services should should be the options should be reviewed and considered as a component of the individual's person-centered services and support plan no less than annually more frequently as necessary or as requested by the individual the staffing ratios for this new service must match the current adult day training services and those ratios are 
one to one, one to three, one to five, or one to six to, through 10. Participation in pre-vocational services is not a required prerequisite for individual or small group supported employment services provided under the waiver. Many individuals, particularly those transitioning from school to adult services, sometimes are likely to choose to go directly into supported employment. A person receiving pre-vocational services may pursue employment opportunities at any time to enter the general workforce. This new service is intended to assist individuals to enter the general workforce, which is the ultimate outcome. The federal waiver requires that the service is limited to individuals 22 years and older. I budget Florida waiver clients accessing pre-vocational services will be eligible for compensation below the minimum wage. However, sub-minimum wage services are not allowable during day habilitation services, such as adult day training. Waiver funding is not available for the provision of vocational services, as we said earlier, and that would be in, in situations where there's a sheltered workshop situation and individuals are producing goods or performing services for a third party. Now, where can this service take place? Pre-vocational services must be provided in community integrated settings or designated locations that are compliant with the federal, federal home and community-based settings rule. The service may be furnished in a variety of locations within the community and not limited to fixed site facilities. The service may be rendered in the same building as an ADT as long as clients are in separate groups. Clients receiving pre-vocational services must have, as we've said earlier, must have an employment goal in their person-centered support plan. Now let's talk more specific about these non-job task specific training skills. Pre-vocational services provide learning and work experiences including volunteer work where the individual can develop, as I said earlier, non-job task specific skills to enable them to gain strength and skills that contribute to employability in paid employment in integrated community settings. These non-job task specific training skills include, but are not limited to, having the ability to communicate effectively with supervisors, coworkers, customers, adhering to generally accepted community workplace conduct and dress codes, following directions, attending to task and task completion, employing workplace problem solving skills and strategies, adhering to general workplace safety, and mobility training. I have just placed a question on the questions tab, and I would like to see if you can please respond to it. And the question is, what is the most important reason why people work? So if you could go ahead and enter some of those reasons. And while you do that, we'll go ahead and continue with our slide. So besides earning a paycheck, people work for a variety of reasons, including self-worth, self-confidence, purpose or direction in life, 
and to learn about personal skills, abilities, and potentials. A key strategy for helping clients achieve employment is to explore the reasons why they want to work. Employment should be an option for any person interested in working, regardless of their label, regardless of their level of support needed, or their perceived functional, functioning level. In order to help your clients find a, the right job, a waiver support coordinator should find out what are the client's personal interests, what are their preferences, their skills, their aptitudes, and life goals. Find out the type of structure the client needs to enable them to apply their skills and reach their employment goals. Will they benefit from a high-level pre-vocational setting or a more structured vocational training program, such as the one provided by the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation? What supports will help the client reach a more independent and self-sufficient life in the community? Having an income increases the client's independence and people who work are typically more self-sufficient. Also as a waiver support coordinator, you can help the client develop their own career path by customizing their planning process that helps establish their career goals based on their personal interests, their preferences, skills, aptitudes, life goals. These considerations should be the basis for crafting their career path. Every person, regardless of their abilities, enjoys the inner feeling of accomplishment. This means different things to different people. There is no one way to measure this. This is closely tied to the person's needs, their desires, their ambitions and drives. As a waiver support coordinator, you can help your client set achievable goals that make them feel happy and satisfied about what they do. Next slide. APD recognizes the benefits of employment as a priority of our agency. Some of the benefits associated with supported employment include self-determination, which is the ability to exercise the same rights as all citizens in our communities, the right to choose where and with whom to live, how to occupy their time and who supports them. APD clients can pursue employment of their choice in community settings of their preference earning competitive wages that are at least equivalent to workers in the same or similar positions. Employment allows for more opportunities for social interactions that build relationships with other people in the community and fosters community inclusion. During the support planning and process and at other times as appropriate, the waiver support coordinator should have conversations with clients about working. These conversations should emphasize the client's skills, strengths, preferences, and abilities. Both supported employment and pre-vocational services are alternatives to facility-based programs such as adult day training. One key distinction is that work readiness is not a prerequisite for community employment. If a client is not ready for work, they can learn skills in pre-vocational training that lead to later employment. Additionally, supported employment services provide, the, provide on the job training that an individual might need to both find and keep a, their job. Next slide, please. APD adheres to the following values of employment. 
presumption of employment. And this is a conviction that everyone, regardless of their level or the type of disability, has the capability and, uh, and the right to a job. Competitive integrated employment. This is a conviction that employment occurs within the local labor market in regular community businesses. Control. This is a conviction that when people with disabilities choose and regulate their own employment supports and services, career satisfaction will result. Commensurate wages and benefits. And this is a conviction that people with disabilities should earn wages and benefits equal to that of coworkers performing the same or similar jobs. Having said that, it is important to recognize that supported employment is very individualized. And there are different models that you can help clients understand when helping them consider employment options. These supported employment models are the individual model, uh, where the individual works in a regular job of their choice. There's the supported employment group model, which includes Enclave, uh, a group approach where the clients work either as a group or dispersed individually through an integrated work setting with supervision. Mobile crews, where a crew such as lawn maintenance or janitorial clients work in the community setting or entrepreneurial model. In addition to that, the supported employment a uh, self-employment model of service is defined as working for oneself with direct control over the work and services undertaken and can include micro enterprise or micro credit arrangements such as proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. Some clients benefit from one or a combination of several of these employment support models. So it is important to realize that no one particular model or type of employment support is the ideal approach for everyone. As mentioned earlier during our presentation, the agency's goal is to increase opportunities and create more pathways to employment for all APD clients who have expressed a desire to find a job, while also bringing the iBudget waiver funded adult day training and supported employment services into compliance with the federal home and community based settings final rule. APD waiver clients can receive both adult day training and pre vocational services, but the services cannot be rendered at the same time. Each service will address specific goals in accordance with the person-centered planning and support plan goals, as mentioned before during our presentation. Clients who attend pre-vocational services to work on their non-job task-specific skills, such as communication and workplace conduct, may wish to be referred to vocational rehabilitation for eligibility determination and to receive services that will result in competitive integrated employment that is individualized, customized, and consistent with their unique strengths, abilities, interests, and informed choice. Once a client achieves job stabilization at VR, meaning that the client has achieved their highest expected level of independence on the job for a period of 90 days and VR closes their case, the client may be ready to transition to supported employment services phase two with APD. One of the most important goals of supported employment is to help individuals find employment that offers competitive wages in typical work settings regardless of disability. Given the proper supports, work environment, 
and the desire to work, all people with disabilities are employable. Identifying the right job for the right person is not an easy task for anyone. As the support coordinator, you know your clients better than other people. Having employment conversations with your clients will build a solid foundation to determine immediate employment interests, identify long-term work goals and career direction. The waiver support coordinator should encourage and support the individual through their journey to employment. To guide your clients to start building a career path, you will want to consider these four key fundamental values as part of the planning prop process. Focuses on the individual's strengths and preferences and interests to help guide the job search and ultimate work selection. Identify a type of job and work environment that will best match a person's work preferences, skills, and abilities. Establish short and long-term goals that will identify employment leading to a preferred career path. Identify and coordinate a network of formal and informal support resources and strategies that will help to ensure long-term employment success. Person-centered planning is intended to help individuals accomplish goals and objectives that they have identified. Numerous person-centered planning models have developed over the past couple of decades. Although there are differences between them, there is one common thread that connects them all and that is the emphasis on helping a person achieve his or her dreams and desires. Person-centered planning techniques need to be the foundation for all conversations and decisions when it comes to employment and career planning. Let's look at Sarah's story, which is an interesting scenario um, I would like for us to, to discuss. Sarah is 27 years old and has been attending the same adult day program for several years. She lives with her parents. And as a support coordinator, you talk to Sandra. Excuse me, I said Sarah, but her name is Sandra. <laughs> you talk to Sandra and her parents to let them know that her ADD program will continue to offer therapeutic recreational activities for APD's clients and day habilitation services. You share information about the new pre-vocational service. Sandra's father asked about some ADT programs in the area and says, she's participated in the day program a long time. That seems to work best for her. She's with people like her, and she gets to do fun things like arts, crafts, day outings, etc. You ask Sandra what she thinks, and she states that the program was sometimes boring. She also states that at times she did not get along with some of the other participants. When you ask her if she would consider working in the community, she quickly repri replies, yes, adding, maybe at the new bookstore that just opened. Her mother says, the idea of Sandra working at a normal job is unrealistic. She tried one job during her senior year of high school, but things didn't work out. She wasn't even able to clock in and out, let alone do the actual job that was expected of her. The day program is just a much better environment for her. I'm going to ask you a series of questions related to this story. And as earlier, if you would just enter your responses in the question box on the right side of the, of the PowerPoint. 
since Sarah has expressed a desire to work, how would you respond to her parents' concerns and objections about community employment? And as a follow-up question, what other new information do you need to gather to best understand Sandra's employment goals and objectives? We're going to look at your answers here and see if see if any of you responded. And here's a third question. What assumptions have Sandra's parents made about their daughter? And that's a good question. Let's see if any of you all responded to the questions so far. Someone said, I would encourage her to participate in a job of her choice by educating her parents in detail about the programs offered by the ADT. And that's a good, that's a good approach, encouraging her to participate in a job of her choice and educating her parents about the ADT program and the details of the program. And someone has suggested she can do both ADT and pre-vocational. That's a good approach as well. Someone said, I would validate the parents' concerns, uh, but also educate them on ways we could find her strengths for an appropriate working environment. Someone suggested that you should determine Sandra's present skills, abilities, and interests, and work on increasing work skills and consider a supervised environment for employment. Another person said, I would explain the new service and how it will help to explore options in a safe environment and give parents time to clear their concerns. I think in this situation, looking at Sandra's story, obviously what Sandra wants is in conflict with what her, her mother's saying. So I think it's a good strategy to talk to both of them and try to alleviate the, the parents' uh, concerns by definitely educating them on the program uh, and, and on the support employment skills uh, that that Sandra will will probably be able to obtain, but at the same time, keeping in mind that what's going to make Sandra fulfilled and happy is what we're all about and trying to put her in a position where she can achieve integrated employment in a community setting. Someone said, I would uh, remind Sandra's parents that she is older now and that trying new things is part of life. That's very, very important. Someone else said, the parents are assuming that Sarah, excuse me, Sandra, cannot gain new skills or knowledge and explain that Sandra has a right to try to work and that we have an obligation to support her as much as possible. Another question that we could also find the answer to is find out what levels of support did Sandra need at her previous job and 
what services that she needed perhaps at the time that she did not receive. So, so that you can bridge the gap between her, her previous experience and the experience you hope that she would have on her new job. What are some things, another question that I wanna ask here is, what are some things about Sandra's past that you need to learn more about in order to provide her with the best employment services now and in the future? And that's a good question. Someone answered that question by saying, by asking another question, what was the previous job? Has Sandra showed any growth since high school? Okay. It's kind of scrolling through some of your answers here. And I think the focus here at this point should be on Sandra, finding out what she wants, what her goals are, what her desires are, and coming up with a strategy that will help her achieve her employment goals. Someone said you would give the parents assurances that Sandra will be safe and supervised while learning vocational skills. And sometimes that is the case uh, the parent uh, of the family may not be on the same page. They may be concerned about the individual safety in a new employment uh, setting. And another important thing that someone pointing out, you will encourage them, the parents, to help her explore what she likes and wants to do and help them see that the goal may be to get as close as possible to her goal. And uh, she will be working on something that she enjoys and have a better well being. We've got a lot of good response from this scenario. And I really appreciate the feedback that you, you all have provided. Someone mentioned, uh, did Sandra receive any skills training to fulfill her job requirements? Uh, and what was her performance before? Someone asked, what were, what were her training opportunities in the past? And what is her learning style? That's an important question. When someone asked the question, uh, what were her barriers in the past and someone used this analogy peel the onion to find out what went wrong so we can know how to address those very issues and someone suggested not everyone stays at their first job maybe she didn't like it in the first place so maybe trying a new opportunity well will work for her. And we've all probably had jobs uh, that we didn't like, uh, didn't like the work we were doing, maybe didn't like the, like the environment and our clients are no different. Okay. Really thank you for the feedback on this story. And, I, and you all have asked some some great questions and your approaches to this, to helping Sandra, I think is real important. Let's go to the next slide. You may be wondering when providers can receive service authorizations for the new pre-vocational services or other service changes. For clients who need pre-vocational services, 
the waiver support coordinator can begin adding the service to the cost plan in January of 2023 so that providers can have service authorizations by February 1st or shortly thereafter. For clients assessing accessing adult day training and supported employment services, changes can be made to the cost plan at any time. To increase to the increased group rates for support employment, uh, we know we as we said earlier, that will match the rates for adult day training effective February of 2023. Support coordinators are required to follow normal protocols for adding services to the cost plan within the client's approved budget amounts. APD will follow normal protocols for determining medical necessity for the services. And for clients who need an increased budget, a support coordinator will follow the normal process for a significant additional needs request or your SAN request. Thank you, Ken. That was very good um, conversations there. Um, I wanted to talk to you also about how to enter employment and benefits data in APD iConnect. Um, there was a waiver support coordinator advisory in 2019. It was 2019-037 called Employment and Benefits Data in APD iConnect. Uh, the reason we're bringing this to your attention is we want to remind all waiver support coordinators of the importance of updating the employment and benefit data in iConnect. Um, well, first and foremost, the handbook requires waiver support coordinators to enter, update, and to make sure that all the information that is in iConnect is accurate, especially the demographic information and other related information for all the clients on their caseload. Um, in order to enter employment and benefit data in iConnect, uh, it that information needs to be entered on the demographic screen. You would click Edit Demographics and a new window opens up. When you scroll down to the bottom of that page, you will see a section called Additional Information. In there, you can fill in the applicable employment and benefit data which includes the social security amount information for the client, their health insurance information or third-party health insurance, uh, whether or not they're competitively employed, yes or no. If they are competitively employed, what was their hire date? What is their monthly earnings? And if they're not competitively employed, do they want employment? That's very important for you to indicate yes or no on that field. This data is used more than you can imagine. <laughs> we use this data to share it with both internal and external stakeholders. Because employment is one of the goals of the agency for all our APD clients or our clients who express a desire to work. Um, our director asks for our employment data um, very, very frequently. Uh, we also share this information for the legislature. We share this information on an annual basis with the Institute for Community Inclusion out of the Boston University. They generate a document uh, about employment of persons with disabilities in our country. And we have to make sure that the, that the employment information we share with them is accurate. We also share this information with our Employment First um, statewide work group and with anyone who at any given time requests this information. This information also helps us to better assist our clients in reaching their employment goals. 
if we if we know that that they want help to get a job we can always find that information and make sure that we're helping them we're helping them get um, the supports and services necessary for them to reach their goal it also helps us track our employment data and identify ways that we can improve uh, we use this data on an annual basis to report on our long range performance plan and um, this data is used as we plan for our future uh, goals and how the agency performs uh, with regards to employment services. So we would really like to encourage you to uh, review that WSC advisory. It is attached for quick access to, um, to this meeting webinar. So you can quickly access that information and review it uh, and please make sure that for every client you have, you have that, uh, that information is updated in a PDI Connect. Thank you very much. And next slide, please. Right now it's time for Miss. We will entertain questions you might have from the question box and if we don't get to your question the answer will be added to the faq which is posted on our website um, let's see if we can answer a few questions here so kent i have one here it's it is um can clients work during adult day training services so beginning in March of 2023, providers will have to comply with the CMS settings final rule, which prohibits clients from working in facility-based settings during waiver services. Waiver services cannot be used to fund facility-based employment. However, clients who work at or above minimum wage can receive supported employment services to assist them in maintaining employment, pre-vocational services will be offered to individuals who need to acquire job skills before working at or above minimum wage. Here's another question. Which ADTs will, will be offering pre-vocational trainings? All of them? Well, APD will start the provider enrollment process for pre-vocational services. So, uh, we will provide information to waiver support coordinators through the regions about available pre-vocational providers in the future, and any ADT provider can apply to expand their services to become a pre-vocational provider, but that information will be forthcoming. Another question is, will therapeutic cre recreation have provider requirements? Therapeutic recreation can be included with uh, just regular, with their ongoing current adult day training services. In which situations will consumers be able to receive less than minimum wage? The iBudget Florida waiver clients accessing pre-vocational services will be eligible for, for compensation below the minimum wage. However, subminimum wage services are not available during day habilitation services, such as adult day training. Um, waiver funding is not available for the provision of vocational services, such as sheltered work performed in a facility, where individuals are supervised in producing goods or performing services under contract to third parties. Um, there's another question. What happens after the 36 months of training and need more time to reach employment goal? Well, clients will have several different options, such as accessing services through vocational rehabilitation, 
um, or companion services or adult day training or supported employment. So there will be other meaningful day activities that they can access at that time. Let's see. In adding life skills development four to an individual's cost plan, how do we know which providers have the services available? Um, again, APD will provide information to WSCs about available providers in the near future. Um, okay, here's another question. Just to confirm, no more paying when working at an enclave, correct? Enclaves may be available to clients as part of supported employment group services. Um, so going forward, uh, the service, the client may benefit from an enclave as part of supported employment services. Here's another question. Where does this leave those folks who have work, work paid, work activity and are at retirement age, are we to end what they have taken on as their identity and self-worth after many years? Um, waiver support coordinators can assist clients in making choices from available options. And so this may include adult day training where clients are not paid for work, companion, pre-vocational or other, um, meaningful day activities. Where is this rule on the changes for the ADTs? Currently, ACA is uh, promulgating changes to the iBudget waiver and iBudget rate table. Um, waiver support coordinators who are interested in being involved in the rules can find information in the Florida Administrative Registry. Um, I think we have time to answer one more question. Where can we get the PowerPoint presentation or this recording? Well, the PowerPoint is available as an attachment to this training, so you should be able to find it by um, clicking on, on the attachment um, dropdown. Uh, it's called handouts. If you click on the handouts drop down, you'll notice that there are two attachments. One is the actual uh, PowerPoint presentation. It's saved as a PDF in the PDF format. And we've also attached for you the WSC Advisory 2019-037 for quick access. If you have any problems accessing these two documents for whatever reason, um, you, you may feel free to send an email to adtinitiatives at apdcares.org and we'll be happy to send them to you by email. Any other questions that um, we didn't, may not have had a, a chance to answer today will be gathered and put together in our frequently asked questions on our website. And there is the link to our website to where you will find those questions. We already have two frequently asked questions documents in there from questions we have received um, thus far. We will be adding both the questions that we received during our provider webinar last week and whatever other questions we may have um, in this webinar. And I think this concludes our presentation. Um, let's see, do we have one more? Thank you very much for your participation in today's uh, WSC ADT redesign webinar. Um, on behalf of Ken Carroll and myself, we want to thank you, wish you a great day today. And here's our uh, contact information for you. And feel free to give us a call or contact us by email. Thank you very much.